Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organisation sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others and the planet. I'm your host, Brad Jennings, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. Welcome to Episode 2 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. It is only fitting that I have Professor Peter Hines as our first guest on the show. Most transformation or improvement journeys organisations undertake, unfortunately, don't succeed. They fall short of initial goals and diminish further over time. Peter has dedicated much of his career on the topic of sustaining improvement journeys within organisations. Peter has also led and written about organisational change programs focused on more than just making money. He has helped these organisations achieve improvement for themselves, others and the planet simultaneously. Peter has recently been inducted into the Shingo Academy, a leading organisation recognising and training on the topics of enterprise excellence. Let's get into the show. Hey, Peter, how are you? Hi, Brad. How are you? Yeah, really good. Really good, Peter. Good. Peter, thank, thank you for joining the podcast and the show. It's only right that we have you on the first one, sort of such an expert and thought leader on enterprise excellence and a leading author. Your background's amazing. I don't want to go too much into it, but Peter, really appreciate you being on the show. Thanks very much, Brad. It's uh, very nice to be here and um, good to share a little bit of my backstory. Yeah, definitely, Peter, definitely. So I'm really keen to know, Peter, so people can understand what created Peter Hines, you know, what created yourself and your history that hopefully people can learn from this, and I'm sure they will. But Peter, what's some of the early significant moments that really shaped you and you think really started to form who you've become? Well, I guess, you know, you can talk about anything from your growing up years or something, but I suppose one of the key things for me was uh, when I went to Cambridge University and did my undergraduate course in the early 80s. And uh, at that point, I did a degree in geography, which uh, is great fun, but doesn't directly lead on to any particular job. So you, you, you yeah. do a very general sort of uh, course. So um, in my case, I very unusually didn't really specialize down into a, a particular subject. So in my last year of the course, I was doing things like uh, urban geography, um, developing countries. Um, I was doing fluvial geomorphology and, and particularly coastal geomorphology. So, um, you know, as you can see, all of those are really very different in terms yeah. of uh, subject. And um, I suppose one of the key things was that it was really in the era um, where the, the predominant sort of thinking methodology was around systems thinking. So I suppose what I was really learning was systems thinking. And um, for instance, when I did my uh, dissertation, um, which uh, fortunate enough to get a prize for that. So that was, that was quite nice. Oh, wow. And that was on salt marsh sedimentation systems. So I was measuring the tidal flows, um, the sediment coming in, um, the sediment settling, um, what sort of factors affected the type and rate of sedimentation and erosion, and then how did the sediment go out? So if you think wow. about it, I was looking at a whole sediment budget, in other words, a system. So yeah. I suppose if you put that into sort of modern thinking, it'd be more like a sort of sidewalk diagram was, was actually what I was doing. And I was, I was doing 30 by 30 regression analysis by hand, pre-computer and so forth. So it, it was, you know, it was great fun. So I suppose what I learned was to look at the world as a system or as a series of systems, which is um, whether we call those processes or systems nowadays, exactly that same sort of thinking. 35 years after that, I still see the world in, in that sort of light. Wow, so that time at Cambridge really gave you the chance to learn how to get up above a system and look at it as a whole, and look at how the whole, whole system interacts together. And I guess That's you've right. been able to apply that then to organizations and other, other elements throughout your career. Yes, yes. I mean, the same sort of thinking would apply um, through my early career. So, you know, my early research career, I was doing a lot of work, <clears throat> particularly at the supplier side of, uh, of, of companies in supply chain. So, um, so at that point, I was trying to understand, um, probably through the book, The Machine That Changed the World with uh, Womack, Jones and Roos, wrote yeah. in 1989, we, we'd probably established... Uh, the Toyota and, 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 and the, the work that they did was outperforming other organizations, certainly in the car industry. 
and it wasn't Toyota and the Japanese were better. It was something about Toyota that was actually better. You know, some of the Japanese were good, but Toyota was that much better. So in the machine, they basically pretty much said that they're twice as good at everything. Then I spent three months working with them in Japan, um, understanding what they did, understanding the supply chain. And, and really, it, it was true. You know, they used pretty much half the resources for everything that they did. They were really, really efficient. So what, what was interesting for me um, at that time was to look at the system whereby they work with the suppliers. So in other words, how did they get all the components and the raw materials and so forth in? So I was interested in that particular system. And, and what I established in, in that research was that Toyota make about, or the, the value or cost adding is about 22%, which is probably well known in, in the literature. So in other words, 78% of what they did in terms of the complete car was actually coming from this supply chain. So what we established from that was there must be, they must be pretty good at managing their supply chain. Otherwise, how are they gonna be so good if they, if they didn't do that? So that was what I was looking at that sort of system. And um, so that, that piece of work um, that was at the beginning of the 90s, I, I basically went and visited uh, eight of Toyota's uh, key suppliers close to the main Toyota city in, in Japan. And then I went to eight, uh, two of each of their suppliers as well. So I ended up with about sort of 20, 25 companies. And then I could benchmark those against an equivalent uh, in the UK. I actually did some comparative work in Korea as well, just as I was sort of relatively in the region. Wow. And what I could establish was that the gaps, if anything, got bigger when you got into the supply chain than they actually did uh, comparing Toyota with, I don't know, Ford or General Motors or something like that. So <clears throat> what this told me was something they were doing in the system of developing the suppliers was actually fantastic. So they had an approach called Kirikukai, or I call it supplier association. Wow. So supplier association was, was basically the, the main system. There were other things as well, but it was the main system that they were using to develop the suppliers. And not only that, it was the main system their suppliers were doing with their suppliers and et cetera down the supply chain. Toyota's suppliers were already doing this in the 1970s. So it wasn't something that had just been invented. It had gone back quite a, quite a long way. So that was the system that I, I really was fascinated. And, and on that sense of Toyota, many years later, uh, doing some work with Jeff Leica, that um, really the other system that Toyota was really fantastic with was the recruitment and induction of people. So if you like, the two systems that I found that were best in Toyota were the two main inputs to the business, the people and the components. Yeah. So in other words, if you get your inputs right and you've got pretty reasonable processes internally, you produce fantastic outputs. So that, that was really what I learned using that sort of systems thinking in my, in my early research uh, career. How amazing is it that you got to study you know, a system like that so early in your career, Peter, like that must have been inspiring for you to be able to get over there into Toyota and really start to understand something like that, that is advanced by most company standards even today. But you're that yeah. you're saying to us, look, it was happening like that 20, 30 years ago. And then you're talking yeah. back in the seventies, if not before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the interesting thing is I, I, I don't see companies today, anything like that sort of system in place. And, um, you know, yeah. the depth of it is, is, was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, when, when I looked at some of the results and some of the benchmarks, you, you were seeing things like, you know, the inventory levels in these first tier suppliers in automotive who are, you know, in most cases, fair, making fairly complex products. So the most complex was a transmission unit, which is obviously, apart from the engine, the main component going in the car, uh, uh, you know, and the other end you're making, decals or stickers so there was a whole a whole range the average inventory in these companies was a day one working day wow um you know they're just in time deliveries were every few hours um their stock turn you know as i said was once a day uh, their just in time delivery was fantastic they were already near enough just over six sigma levels in in the early 90s um, and you know the quality was fantastic the delivery performance was fantastic the on-time delivery was 99.97 percent i think something like that wow. at the time 
and that was in the right hour. And at the time, Europe was about 90% in the right day. So, you know, that was, that was uh, yeah, as you say, I was very fortunate that I was given that opportunity to, uh, to, to visit them. And um, uh, what, what was nice, I was able to pay them back because it, it was a research institute that funded it that was um, basically part of the Toyota organization. So I was Hi. given a fellowship there. And um, what I was able to establish during that research um, was that they were fantastic at developing their direct suppliers, you know, the component suppliers, and then the component suppliers developed theirs, and it went right down to home workers at the third, fourth, fifth tier, et cetera. But, but what I noticed, so the raw material wow. percentage of a Toyota car was actually really high because they were so efficient at making components. Oh, yeah. So I actually looked at this, and Toyota were very clever, together with other Japanese car makers, they used to make central contracts for all sort of steel and plastic that then all the suppliers could call off and hence get a, a you know, the Toyota price. Uh, but what they now. hadn't really done is a lot of development activity. They hadn't really got the just in time and they hadn't got the improvement in uh, delivery performance. The quality was already good. So I was, I was able to sort of show them there was a bit of a blind spot here and the result of that, when I fed it back to Toyota and, and colleagues in, in the research centre, was they could understand that. And what was interesting was two years later, um, the annual Toyota report, which was about 95, I think, something like that, was how we, saw, how we saved $1 billion. And they basically wow. talked about how they did a supply development programme with uh, their raw material suppliers, oh, which was basically... Impressive. I didn't do any of the work myself, but I'd help them to identify uh, that problem, which they could then go and put a series of countermeasures. So it was nice to feel I'd, I'd given back something to Toyota. Um, and then afterwards, I helped them set up the same approach in the UK operation and Europe. So uh, it, was, it was fun, those early years, yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing story. And like having that sort of background, like I know a few of you went in at that time, Peter, and you know, what you have done with that knowledge, what you gained early on, but then what you've gained since has been brilliant. Is, was that a real inspirational moment for you to keep on in the career and keep following the whole path of enterprise excellence? Yeah, I, I, th I think so. I mean, obviously in those years, no one talked about the word enterprise excellence and, you know, we used lean mostly as the language at that stage, although there was, you know, some other approaches as well. And um, yeah, it was a real inspiration. And, uh, you know, after that, um, together with Dan Jones, we set up the Lean Enterprise Research Centre at Cardiff University. Uh, we started in 94. And as I say, some of the early work was with Toyota, helping them set up their supply development uh, activity, which was great fun. You know, we did a lot of work also in other automotive industry. You know, we worked with many of the um, main car makers in Europe and many of the component and logistics and, and you know other companies so probably by the sort of 97 98 we, we got a really good understanding of how lean would apply in the car industry but you know what was starting to intrigue us at those days was that well the car industry is like eight or ten percent of GDP of most uh, most countries yeah. um, so what about the 90 percent so we were sort of intrigued with with that so we, we had a little steering uh, group uh, set up with, uh, with our research centre. And, and one of those was the supply chain director of Tesco, um, which um, on a global basis, I think is number three supermarket company uh, these days. And at that stage, they were number two in the UK. We got talking to them and we said, well, why don't we this improvement approach in... Um, uh, the supermarket industry, which of course would be radically different from any manufacturing, because it was a non-manufacturing environment. And obviously I was quite keen because effectively uh, Tesco is a supply chain organization. So obviously with my supply chain background, yeah. um, that was interesting for me. So we started yeah. to work with Tesco. We started to do some nice stuff. We started to experiment with things. In some cases we were re reverse engineering stuff from uh, the automotive industry. So, for instance, we did a supplier association with uh, Tesco. Um, we developed um, approaches where um, effectively the delivery was organized by Tesco. So, you know, the, the, the customer orientated the delivery and the pickups, which saved them a lot of, a lot of money, etc. 
We piloted things like uh, one touch replenishment, which then turned into uh, shelf ready packaging. So one touch replenishment was basically packing product onto shelves. Another thing is we looked at the whole delivery system. So the physical distribution system. So we looked at deliveries from um, suppliers to their own distribution centers to um, Tesco distribution centers to store and then the reverse flow of pallets and, and, and so forth. And we looked at the whole system and we found that actually there were a lot of trucks going around that were half empty or fully empty on the reverse loads. So we sort of looked at how you could optimize that. And, and what they'd done previously is they'd optimized each piece, but they hadn't optimized the whole system. So doing that, we actually uh, managed to um, improve the, um, we actually developed a term. So many of, our, many, many of our listers will be familiar with overall equipment effectiveness. Mm. So we modified that a little bit, the calculation, and we talked about the overall vehicle effectiveness. And we will manage to improve the overall vehicle effectiveness of the Toyota, uh, sorry, of the Tesco supply chain by 30%. So wow. that basically meant just for the UK, it was a 200 million pounds a year saving just That's by huge. having less transport on the road. Now, in actual fact, we didn't do that for an economic benefit. Um, we actually did it uh, for risk mitigation and an and environmental benefit. Wow. So the reason we did it was um, in the UK, there was a lot of legislation coming in, which obviously has come around the world as well, about um, uh, movement of uh, transport and so forth. So we sort of developed the doomsday scenario and, and the doomsday scenario would be that trucks wouldn't be allowed on, on the motorways during the day for congestion reasons. And then they wouldn't be allowed in cities at night um, for noise and, and, and so forth. And hence, if that legislation came in, it would be an utter nightmare for, for Tesco and obviously other people in that industry. And they'd have to put up cross docking operations at the edge of cities and, you know, it'd be hugely expensive. So we basically said, well, why, what, what could we do to reduce the number of trucks on the road so that we can actually go to government and say, look, we're doing our bit, don't put legislation. So we were able to do that, and it's quite nice to get a two hundred million pound benefit out of something That's a that big was game. basically a risk mitigation, uh, but clearly environmental benefits, uh, cost benefits, and uh, you know. So out of that, we we formed with Tesco a little thinking which was uh, uh, better, cheaper, um, simpler. Yeah. So that's... so sim you know simpler was it's easier better is it's better for ourselves but but it's better for the customers and, it, and it's good for our staff as well and then they use that as a rule of thumb which was basically if it's not if it doesn't save money if it's not better for our employees and it's not better for the customer we're not doing it and and that was basically uh you know a, a remit i'll stop right. i can go on for hours about tesco <laughs> i could imagine peter like i but i guess hearing you talk about i see that holistic view that you've always I've always seen in the books you've written and the talks you've done you know talking about getting environmental gains at the same time as economic at the same time as mitigating risk mm -hmm. sure you've got sure. a natural skill at looking at the bigger picture and then helping take a customer on that journey but what was it I know there was a time in your career that you really went strongly into academia then also set up the lean enterprise Re uh, research center sure. do you mind giving a bit of background on that side of things well, I mean, the origin of that was um, <clears throat> that I did um, an MBA program at uh, Cardiff University at the end of the 1980s. And uh, I sort of got interested in, you know, the research side and I wanted to do more work um, on, you know, studying for the essays and so forth. Uh, probably, I don't know, like yourself or, or others, if, if you've done like a, a master's degree or a PhD on a part-time basis, it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah, not so easy. I, I found myself, um, and I took this decision when I was really being stretched at work. So I'd worked all week, I worked all the Saturday, and I was sitting on Sunday morning at work, uh, trying to do some research from a marketing essay, I think it was. And I was trying to supervise some of my guys in the warehouse doing some stuff and picking some product and so forth. And I just thought, well, you know, this isn't right. How, how can I be 
on my seventh day of the week trying to do my you know work for MBA and yeah, I, you know yes yeah, so not easy. I took the decision yeah so I took the decision at that point that I'm going to quit my job um, and 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 do some more work in uh, the university side um, so so I quit my job um, and um, and then I said to myself well what am I going to do because you know I don't have a job now um, and I've got time to, to do my MBA but I don't have any income so I said well what what could I do three days a week that would pay the same as five days a week previously so I thought ah I'll do some consulting because that's well paid so that's what I did so you know right right from that about 1990 I started off on this career that was sort of spanning consultancy and, and university side so so I basically started doing uh, consulting work um, and really with the uh, Welsh Development Agency, which was like a government agency in Wales. And, um, and then I was doing the MBA. So my dissertation for the MBA, um, which got another prize, by the way, but there we go. Oh, uh, wow. was actually the first uh, supplier association uh, in the UK. So we worked with a company called Calsonic, uh, which is a Nissan affiliate making radiators and cooling oh. systems. Yeah, and and set up a supplier development uh, activity with them, and and the result of that um, was that I started to do consulting, I started to do university, and then after about a couple of years of that, the university offered me uh, a post, so I took wow. the post in the university, um, which was um, doing research in supply chain, and then after um, a few months, I set up the materials management unit which i suppose in today's term would be supply chain and um over the next couple of years built that up from myself and and one other colleague who joined me right at the beginning to five of us and then we started to do a little bit of work in 94 with uh, dan jones who co-wrote the machine that changed the world and lean thinking books yeah so dan was a little bit of a lonely soul because he he saw the world in a quite practical way and most people in academia saw it, you know, very much in terms of theory and, you know, economics and this sort of thing. And, and he was an, a trained economist um, and, and he couldn't really find a home in, in that environment. But he, he could with with me and my colleagues, because we basically come from industry. So we started to work together a little bit, did a bit of research together. And then we decided to set up the Lean Enterprise uh, Research Centre, which was basically the materials management unit and Dan. So we became six of us. And then from 94, we built that up and, and at its peak, we had about 30 research staff uh, working in that center, which is probably makes it the largest um, academic research center on um, lean. But even wow. so we were seen slightly as uh, mavericks because you know, lean is not a proper um, academic subject like marketing or yeah, sales, I guess, in your case, or, or yeah. uh, HR or finance or something like that. So we we sort of did our own thing and we were seen as a little bit odd because we did very much uh, practical research work. We worked with companies like Tesco, as I mentioned. And, and over the years, we worked with many, many different companies, many, many sort of industries and so forth. And uh, that was great fun. It was great fun. But in those years that you were, you were running through the your academia, Lean Enterprise Resource Center, working with Toyota, working with like Tesco's, who were some people that really inspired you through those? Who really inspired you like you've inspired others with enterprise excellence and lean and continuous improvement? Well, I, I guess there's a few people that, you know, for me were quite inspiring during that uh, time. Uh, I suppose Dan was the obvious one in, in some of the early um, work that we did in Lean and obviously learning a lot from uh, from from him. Um, but I suppose the, the one going back that was probably most important for me was a guy called uh, Professor Mashiyoshi Ikeda, um, who's not especially famous certainly outside of japan during the uh, 1991 period when i was doing my own thing and, and and so forth um i actually did a my first visit to japan was uh was was a um like a, a benchmarking trip organized by the eu japan um collaboration center so it was funded by the eu 
and it was a free trip apart from you had to pay for your own accommodation and, and flights and, and expenses etc and um, on that trip there was uh, three days of lectures in Tokyo from academics Japanese academics six six lectures and then we went out and we studied uh, companies in my case looked at supply chain and companies and one of the lecturers was uh, was Professor Ikeda and he was at uh, one of the universities in um, in Tokyo Chuo University and he was basically talking about how the Japanese subcontracting system worked. And I was fascinated by, by this. So I stayed in touch with him and he was fascinated with how did the European subcontractor system work as well oh. as Japan. So a lot of my early learning was actually from Professor Ikeda. And what I used to do is I used to organize his research trips for him. So, you know, no one, no one paid anyone. <laughs> So he, he, he said what he wanted to do. He, he said, I want to visit this number of companies. And obviously I, I did these particularly in the UK and I contacted the companies. I got him the, the place and then he came over sometimes on his own and sometimes with colleagues. And then I drove him around in my little Renault five sort of car and um, took him to two or three a day. And he did the interviews and, but, and he thought he was getting a good deal because, you know, he, he got this great research access, which would have been very difficult to organize from Japan. But for every minute I was with him and I used to take him around castles and things in the weekend and so forth. Every minute I was with him, I was picking his brains for everything that he knew. So this poor guy was sort of completely sucked dry during these visits yeah. he came. And, and I was just driving around. I was just learning this stuff. And, and, and hence I got a very detailed, understanding of how the the japanese supply system worked and not not just the two to one because he it, it's strange in japan because the academics it's like you know they have this karetsu system in japan where you, you you become the sort of club of a major company and he was in the club of t nissan oh, so wow. he was a nissan academic he wasn't nissan paid academic. by nissan but all these links were with nissan and nissan supply chain and it was it was like he was part of a Nissan Karetsu, and it, it's something we don't quite have. So hence, I had unrivaled access into the Nissan uh, supply chain and, and, and so forth in Japan. So he organized visits for me and, uh, you know, et cetera. So, so I suppose he was, you know, in the early days, the, the formative uh, sort of guy that got me on this sort of supply chain uh, journey and so forth. I can really relate to that. Like, I know when I've spent time with you or I spend time with other people you, you've just got to make the most of it don't you every moment you can get with someone who has that sort of experience and knowledge you, you do you sort of have to pick people's brains um, I have to say being on the other side of it it's quite wearing if someone's picking your brains all day <laughs> you know you have a workshop and then they're picking your brains during the break and you've yep. got to just have a rest for five minutes yeah so you, you hit that minutes. you hit that mastery and then everyone's everyone's picking your brain rather than the other way around yeah Exactly. Peter, I know that yeah. around that time after or during Lurk and Cardiff University and after that, you established SA Partners and you, you went out sure. and built a, a business and built your own consultancy firm. What, what drove that? Well, I mean, there were a number of things that, that drove that. So um, the, the, the company is called SA Partners. So SA stands for Supplier Association. So, so hence the origin of the business actually came from that early uh, research activity so so really the, you know the story i was telling earlier was that um you know i was offered this this job at cardiff university and then the welsh development agency said well you know you've done this really successful pilot with calsonic and you know it's been really good and we were filmed for the bbc and you know all this type of stuff and wow. um but now you've gone to university well what do you you know we want to do more of it so i said well you know, I was a contractor, so, you know, there's no contract, so I've taken a job. So they said, well, how do we continue? How do we continue this work? So, so basically what we did is together with the, the, the guy in the, the, the um, Walsh Fund agency, uh, we identified another sort of similar person to myself, a guy called Paul Morris, and I, I trained him up. I think that constituted an afternoon sitting in my office in the university it was the training program. Wow. Yeah. And um, so then Paul went through the same learning curve and, and he set up a supplier association 
funded by you know the government agency and and um, so Paul started doing this work and then after uh, after Paul had done I don't know, it's three or four something like that we we actually did the um, you know the the Toyota one together so it was partly him and partly the university oh, wow. so around that time we we decided that um, we, maybe we should set up a company and, and because we only did supplier associations we called it supplier association partners so supplier association partners became Paul working full time and um, in the university environment in the UK maybe in other countries as an academic you're allowed to do a little bit of your own private work as long as there aren't conflicts and so forth so I could do half a day a week so our company was sort of 1.1 full-time equivalents and we did that for a, for a number of years up till about 97 98 and then um, uh, actually the guy that I worked with at Calsonic uh, who was who'd, who'd gone on to become the co-plant manager by by that stage he, he, he said, I've been at Calsonic for, I don't know, 25 years. And unless I leave now, I'll never leave. Or I'll only leave in a box, I think he said. Yeah, okay. So, and he also knew Paul. So the three of us knew each other. And, and, and he said, well, would you be interested if I uh, come and join you? And Paul was sort of, Paul and I were sort of happy enough doing our own thing and so forth. But another thing, a coincidence happened that we, we started doing work. Uh, we were asked to do work with the Mars organization. Um, which obviously for us was, you know, a big feather in the cap as a, you know, large multinational. And this was right at Mars's beginning of their lean journey. And um, there were two sites in the UK that we were, pro well, there were four sites, but two, two pairs, if you like. So one was the confectionery division in Slough, which is the main um, Mars bars and, and so forth. And then uh, the other was a company called Foursquare, where it changed its name later. Uh, and they made the, the drinks, the drinks machines um, and the, um, the, the things that went in them. So this is like Flavia and Clicks, if you're familiar with those, yeah. uh, with those brands. Yeah. And, 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 and basically both of those wanted probably about one and a half to two people worth of resource each. So they were fighting each other for our very limited resource of yeah. what we could actually give. And then Lynn came along and we decided, well, why don't, you know, it all came together. So we, we started and Lynn joined. And then we said, well, what, what does a proper company do? And we said, well, we get an office. So we got an office and, and, we, and we get an admin person. So we got an admin poor person, which was Paul's daughter. And then what else do we do? Well, we hire staff. So we hired a couple of people as well. You know, we, we had really very little idea of running a business and, you know, so we went from 1.1 to 5.1 in three months, I think. And, uh, and that was sort of 98. And that was really the origin of SA Partners. And then from that point, it became a proper business. And then, you know, we, we, we then, probably from about 2000, we then started to hire a lot of people, take on a lot of programs and, and, and build a business from that point. And so at that point, I was sort of still partly university partly SA Partners, I, I did a bit more SA Partners, I bought some time out. So, uh, you know, for many years, I, I sort of have done some academic stuff and some consulting stuff and sort of had a, a mix of the two. That's a great blend, having that, being able to really research and study and understand and be that thought leader and then put it practically into play. Like, I've really heard that throughout your career, Peter, right from, right from the start, that whole knowledge expertise theory but also then the practical application i think that's that's powerful because often you're either one or the other i mean it's it's, it's quite funny it, it it's sometimes difficult because in the academic cons, uh, community they don't think you're a proper academic and in the consulting yeah. acad uh, community they sort of think you're an academic really so but you know it's it's probably much more like the faculty school of tradition from germany the polytechnic sort of tradition from the uk you know that sort of practical hands-on sort of uh, way of thinking so, yeah, well, which done, you know, I, I like anyway. it's done you well Peter it's done you very well thank you <laughs> Peter what got you into writing books I've been through that that's a big job takes a lot of effort you've written sure. 10 plus books what sure. what started you down sure. the line of writing books and I know that you were one of the first to ever write about sustaining an excellence journey too and I, I that's what first caught my eye about you and your sure. work sure 
Well, um, I suppose what, what got me into writing books was probably, a, I don't know if it was a, a innate lean thinking or actually it was more, uh, I'd learned lean, but um, actually to, to be honest, I'm not the leanest person in my family. My, my wife is a naturally lean thinker. So she's incredibly well organized and, you know, everything is on a pool basis and, you know, it's all fantastic. And Same with my, my office. Um, so, yeah, what got me into it was, was really um, thinking about when I was doing my PhD, which was basically around, um, you know, the, um, the supply development, which was sort of in the 92, 95 period. And um, I started to think to myself, well, what, what am I doing here? I, I want to do a PhD because, you know, that's what you do as an academic, et cetera. And I did it as a, as a full-time staff member. And I said, well, what's the output? Well, the output's a PhD, which is a piece of paper. Well, you know, that's fantastic. It's good for a career, but surely there must be more, in, more to it than writing and getting a piece of paper and doing, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of work. Yeah. So I said, well, who's the customer here? So I said, well, okay, I'm the customer to some degree, but surely the customer is people that could benefit from this research. Yeah. And if you look at the typical PhD, it's probably read by about three or four people. So I said, well, why don't I expand my customer base? So maybe it's on your area in sales and so forth. Yes. So understanding the voice of the customer. So I said, well, surely the customer is those guys out in industry who have supply chains that are not working as well as they might be. So I said, well, if that's the customer, how am I going to communicate and, and help them? So surely the best thing to do would be to write a book, which can then be read by many people. So my first book called Creating World Class Suppliers, which was sold about 5,000 copies, which, okay, does, it's not, you know, millions, but it, it was a reasonable number of copies. Yeah. So basically I wrote the book and then turned the book into the PhD. Oh, that's a great way to go. So I did it the other way around. So the reason I wrote the book was was such. And then I, I sort of enjoyed uh, writing the book. And I did the book writing in a very lean way. So I wrote the book over a two-month period oh, that's um, quick. in 23 working days. So I basically sat down at 10. I went to university, did all the sort of stuff I needed to do, 10 o'clock, sat down, worked till four or five, 5,000 words a day. 115,000 words bang book finished and That's that was that was the first book so that was how i you know i started with books and um so that the point about you know sustainability and so forth probably came to to me around about the early 2000 2002 2003 and i suppose two two things that i started to do or, or i learned so one was um Myself and, and one of my colleagues, Donna Samuel, she, we, we were doing some work with uh, the SPA organization. So I, I don't know if all our readers, uh, listeners are familiar with SPA, but SPA would be like a 7-Eleven type uh, convenience store, um, which would be big in Europe, maybe not in other parts of the world. And it's, it's best described as a multi-level franchise. It's technically not that, but so there's a global version, there's a UK version, and then effectively there's different distributors. So in the UK, there's six or seven distributors who own a territory, and then they can distribute spa branded product into that territory. And though each of those owns a certain number of stores. So the, the, the business that we dealt with had the, the Southeast of England, South of London, and also Wales, and the headquarters was, was in Wales. So, it was called Kappa and Co. And Mr. Kappa was, was the boss. So what, what we worked with that organization, it was partly because we, we, were, we, we, we liked to have a bit of fun. And, and a bit of fun was, this was sort of not exactly a rival with Tesco, but it sort of was. So, uh, so we, we thought, well, Donna and I, let's see if we can do some stuff with, with Spa that would be better than Tesco. So we did some work, which was really around rapid replenishment uh, in the stores. So we basically put in a uh, electronic based pull system where we had a daily replenishment of product from store to the distribution center, to suppliers, bring the supply in, cross dock it through and get it to the company. And all of this stuff was sort of at the, at the leading edge of Tesco, but we were doing it with this sort of spa organization. And because it was small, we could get it to go work really well. 
and it was really fantastic and we got really fresh produce so we did it in produce to make you know fruit and veg we got really yeah, fresh an important area. Um, and, and the reason being if we could get it to work there we could roll it out to other categories and you know for ambient product you know if, if it was more cost effective well why don't we roll this sort of cross docking type approach across so we, you know we did the pilot work there you know it it wasn't like a long-term consulting it, it was you know it was a university project and then we left them to it you know we, off you go bill and a team and, and then it just so happened i met bill uh, at a social occasion uh, about two years later uh, strangely enough so i got chatting to him and, and said uh, well how's it going bill you know and, and how's how's the work going and, I, and he was saying oh yeah it's going well and you know we've done this and we've done this and we extended it to this and you know results are coming and you know etc so, so oh, that's, that's that's really nice I'm, I'm pleased to hear that and he said why don't, why don't you come down and you know have a look and so we arranged a date and i went down and i i remember going in and walking through the front doors of the company and then seeing the visual management this was you know in the foyer and on the walls and all this so it'd be about 2002 2003 something like that and and the overriding emotion that I had at that point was surprise. And then I thought to myself, yeah. why was I surprised? Because if they'd started something, I don't know, two years earlier, and it was still going, I have to say, why should I be surprised at those gains and, and improving on it? But then it struck me that actually that was the normal case. If you'd started a program two years ago, for many or most organizations, it probably would have slipped or even fallen apart and unless someone was there driving it. And obviously, as the outside people, we'd gone. And hence, this whole how do you sustain came into, into mind. So we started to think about this. And then in my teaching, I was teaching a, a lean MBA or a lean masters at, at Cardiff. I started to use an iceberg. So the top of the iceberg above the water was the lean tools and techniques we'd be all familiar with or Six Sigma or Agile, you know, uh, and, and maybe processes. You know, a lot of us had started to map out processes and we, we'd started doing value stream mapping from about 94 uh, I think in in Cardiff so really we, we do a lot of experience but then we saw below the surface in other words what's the really important stuff that I'd seen at Toyota that actually people weren't doing so what I'd seen was was strategy deployment leadership engagement and behavior in those early 2000 years I put that as below the surface and the staying lean book sort of talks about that and books since then so really a lot of a lot of the work that I've done since you know that early 2000s has been much more on that below the surface because I think most of us are quite familiar with you know the lean the agile the six sigma tools and techniques and to some degree they're variations on themes you know the the, the different tools and that's one of the reasons why we started to use the term enterprise excellence because some of the early lean stuff and certainly the six sigma stuff um, and, and the agile stuff as well can come across as very tools and technique -y. I call it the Spockian view of the world. So <laughs> this is Mr. Spock with yeah. the pointy ears. You know, it's logical, it's sensible. But if it's logical and sensible, but some are losing their job, it may not be logical and sensible to them and their colleagues. So this, how do you get people to do the thinking themselves? rather than be told what to do or pushed into improvement. So what was missing in a lot of that early stuff, and, and, and to be fair, probably a lot of the work that we did in the 90s, you know, in, 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 in research, consulting work, was actually this sort of people side. So it's, it's a bit like a bridge, you know, one side of the bridge is very much about the techniques, the tools, the, the logical thinking, the Spockian view. And the other is about this sort of culture and leadership and, and, and way of dealing with people and engaging people and the, setting the right behaviors and so forth. And, and the issue is that, you know, this side of the bridge isn't right and this side isn't wrong, but this isn't right and this isn't wrong. If you want to create this, this sustainable lean journey, you actually have to build the bridge together. So the most recent book is very much about how do you bring the two sides together? So how do you design systems that not only technically strong, but actually they engage people, they create the right behaviors. And I suppose in, in that thinking that what was behind me was one of the questions that I asked many years before when I was doing that Toyota research. And I asked uh, probably about 50 of the Toyota sort of managers or senior managers, why is it that Toyota seems to be outperforming other companies? 
their first feedback was to be slightly embarrassed and to thank me, but to actually be quite humble uh, about, you know, we just do simple things, you know. Uh, um, and when I pressed them, they, they all gave me pretty much the same answer. And it wasn't some, you know, answer they had to give that had been told to them. And, and the answer they gave was the rigorous and disciplined application of the Toyota production system. And, and so as a young academic, uh, you know, in my 20s, I was my notebook and I was writing down Toyota production system, Toyota production system, Toyota. Yeah. And the more I wrote that down, you know, by the time I got to 46, the less I was believing that this was the right answer. And I eventually got to the point where I, I, I started crossing this out because I realized that this wasn't the right answer. And the Roman of revelation in my mind was saying, you are pretty stupid because you haven't been writing down what they've been telling you. They had told me the rigorous and disciplined application of the Toyota production system. And I'd been writing down the Toyota production system. And by the time I'd, I'd spent two and a half months there, I actually realized that the rigorous and disciplined application of was actually the most important part of the sentence. And I hadn't even been writing it down, which actually is the culture, the leadership, the behavior. So in other words, what they were saying is create the right culture and have a good improvement methodology and you'll close the bridge. But I didn't really understand that at the time. But Peter, you were one of the first to cotton on to it, to connect the dots. The amount of excellence journeys that people have started to just have fail. When I saw that book, Staying Lean, that you first wrote, that was the first one I've ever discovered that spoke about anything along that topic of people first, people, culture, process, tools and techniques and technology. Yeah, I certainly wasn't the first to do it. I mean, there was a whole load of people from the HR community that have been talking about this for many years. So, you know, if, if, another influence on me um, was in 94, when we were sort of moving from supply chain into the sort of wider lean. So this was just at the starting of the Lean Enterprise Research Centre. I, I read a book called The Fifth Discipline, uh, oh, yeah. which was by Peter Senge. Some yeah. people might be familiar with that. And Peter Senge was a professor at uh, MIT at the time. And uh, this was a very, you know, widespread, important book. And it was about the learning organization. And, it was, and I have to say, I, I, I really found it quite hard going. Um, I read it. I sort of understood it. And he was sort of talking about soft systems. And I was used to hard systems. So I sort of got the systems bit like salt marsh because, you know, that was a hard system. But because I was used to hard systems without any human bit, the human bit, I, I, I sort of only partly got. And I happened to reread that book uh, about well, about two years ago. Chris and I were writing the Essence of Excellence book. And I just thought, bingo, this is absolutely bang on. But I didn't have the knowledge to understand. You know, I didn't have the brain to, to actually understand it at the time. And what Peter was talking about in the book was a learning organization. And I just, it all just fell into place. And I said, bingo, that's actually what Toyota had. They had a learning organization. So, you know, since that time, I've done a little bit of work, as I said, with Jeff Leiker and, you know, visited some Toyota sites and this sort of thing. And, and it's a learning organization. And, and hence, the main role of a manager in Toyota is teaching and learning. Yeah. So in K site uh, where they make uh, cars, the Bernstein site near Derby, they have an obey room, which is basically the learning system for people end to end from recruitment all the way through through their career. So what are the, how do they learn? How do we measure them? How do we develop them? What behaviors do we expect from them, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that was really what Peter Senge was, was talking about. And, and what I noticed in the literature was no one was, well, there were one or two people sort of touching on it, but people weren't really linking learning with lean. They weren't bringing those two things uh, together. Really the HR folk, they didn't really know what lean was. And lean folk didn't know much about HR, so it, this bridge didn't join. It was largely the whole learning and development in organisations was generally pushed by HR. So in other words, we were pushing training courses. So in a large company, here's the menu of courses you can do. At best, which one would you like to do? At worst, we have to have two people from our department do this course and I, you've been volunteered sort of type of thing. In other words, it was largely pushed rather than what do the what are the skills and the capability required by this team for the problems that they've got and their learning and their development, etc. In other words, we pull the learning and development. 
and most of the learning and development is done by the line manager actually rather than HR it's actually done but so it's on the job so hence and we'll talk about this in more detail next time is the framework through the the four core operating systems in in the essence of excellence book the plan is behavioral and strategy plan fair enough what do we need to do why and, 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 and so forth continuous improvement is the do make the changes leader standard work is check whether or not we're actually applying the strategy the behaviors we're making improvements we're engaging everyone if we are we recognize people um, if we're not we don't blame people we then have identified a coaching and development need so hence yeah. the last of the systems this this learning and development which is a core role for the line manager is the learning and development and and i remember talking with um you know various sort of senior ceos senior managers and um i said to them what, what what's been the most satisfying thing in your career and often the comment they said is is developing my people or actually developing people to become as good or or, or better and we're probably out of time now but i mean I probably one of my stuff. proudest things is is that in the lean enterprise research center you know we weren't proper academics you know you were these sort of jumped up consultants but not including myself and dan eight of my colleagues have gone on to be full uh, professors in their own right and at least of those and i'll give him a name check matthias holvig um he he's certainly out, well outshone me in terms of his academic career and he's gone on to be a professor at oxford university which uh, certainly well, it makes me very proud to uh, he's achieved that, uh, you know, that and so forth. That's so. amazing. And Peter, thank you for all that backstory to your career. And I really appreciate it. And the next cast will go into enterprise excellence and explore. That was a sure. very good segue to end the show and we'll pick it up again in the next episode. And Peter, thank you again for your time. It's much appreciated. Great. Okay. Nice to talk to you, Brad. Okay. Bye now. Thanks, Peter. Bye.